Well, hello there. Welcome back to The Big Interview. We've missed you. You know we have. Just before Christmas, it's the right time not only to let this Alan Pardew interview come out to our audience, but um, to say thank you. 2015 has been a marvellous time talking to fascinating people and finding out that you enjoy listening to those conversations. Cheers for that. Talking to Alan Pardew was a priority for me because when we've done tiny little bit of information exchanges, I've really enjoyed hearing from him. I thought that, as with all big interviews, I wouldn't go into this chat with a roadmap about where I wanted to get to, rather simply ask the questions I was curious about. What emerges is a story of pivotal moments in your life and in your career. For example, Tom Oshevsky at Wembley for Poland against England in 73. It's not me who raises football club Barcelona, it's Alan and the dream team, the effect they had on him. Charles Hughes and his Neanderthal football teachings, the effect they had on Alan Pardew. Alan's determination to make it through from non-league football in his mid-twenties to within a blink of a footballing eye to be at Wembley twice um, as, a, as, a, as a successful footballer, proving that all along his determination to not accept rejection was right. But he also brings up life-changing moments like a car smash that could have ended his life, in truth. Accepting a pay cut to become a professional footballer. Just think about that in this modern day where we're beginning to talk about should a top player be earning £300,000 a week or four? But also moments in football. 3-0 up, 3-3, nearly losing, nearly losing his job. Nearly going through to the Europa League semi-final with Newcastle. Just split-second moments. But for me, the most important moment in this conversation is the fascinating tale of Nigel Rio Coker, the FA Cup final, West Ham Liverpool and Steven Gerrard. You'll have a laugh listening to tales about Gaza, for example. Alan's views on Sven Goran Eriksson are interesting. All in all, this is typical of him. He's very forthright. I enjoyed the answers. I enjoyed the process. And if you can hear a little bit of twittering away in the background, those are the lovebirds. They really are. First of all, it's a pleasure to see you again. You've been awfully kind to me in my career and it's been nice meeting you and watching your progress. I enjoy your football and I enjoy what you represent about football. And if you'll sort of tolerate me, where I want to start with is asking a question about what was the first time you can remember going to Wembley or wanting to go to Wembley, presumably as a youngster? And, and what did Wembley growing up mean to you? Well, the 66 World Cup, I was five. I have no recollection of that, which I'm kind of shames me to some degree. <laughs> I don't know why, because um, my dad was a massive football fan and we used to watch football together yeah. on terrestrial TV, because obviously there was only two channels or three channels was coming or four channels was on the way. My earliest memory of Wembley is not a particularly great one. It was the Poland game. Oh gosh, yeah. When Sir Alfred, uh, we'd won you know, we was 74, we'd done the 1970 World Cup, which was a massive memory for me because that was ingrained me into the Brazilian yeah. and, and the way, the beauty of football and the romance and everything. And 74 was the reality and the harshness of how it can be. What football can be like? So I was in love till 1974 <laughs> and then I realised, wow. What has happened there? The tackle on the halfway line, the miss. The, the, Is that Norman Hunter's tackle? Yeah, the, he misses the tackle. Yeah. You're like, oh, oh dear. And I, uh, enough about me uh, as a, a, a teenager, well, early teenager then, to realise that, oh my goodness, they've scored. This is going to be a long night. <laughs> and, it, and it was. So that is my earliest memory. Of course, we never, uh, working class background, never really went to Wembley uh, uh, until I was... Probably, uh, I would have been about 22, 23. I went to a couple of games at Wembley. I remember seeing, I don't know what year it was, when it was actually the best, and you all know this team pretty well, um, Barcelona won, Sampdoria nil, yeah. and Koeman, Koeman scored. scored. Goal, yeah. And he was an unbelievable performance at centre-half. And I remember sitting there watching that game 
and really taking in the technical. So it's always been kind of had uh, peaks and troughs, yeah. Wembley, for me, throughout my career, for various different reasons. I, I don't mean, mean to make this a stupid question, but what motivated you to go to Barcelona Sampdoria? So in other words, it pops ahead of saying England International, it pops ahead of somebody in, in the pub saying to you or to your dad, there's a ticket for a semi-final, there's a ticket for the final, whatever. What, what drew you to that match? Well, because if I'm right, you, you wouldn't have been able to see a massive amount of either Barcelona or Sampdoria on the television by then, because it's 92, and there's still not a lot of coverage of continental football. No, I'd been to a couple of games at Wembley, but not many, probably internationals or whatever. It's the first game I probably watched and realised that Champions League final, obviously, that this was a different type of football. Mm -hmm. uh, because obviously, as you're saying, there wasn't much coverage on TV of any kind of foreign football. No. Uh, national teams, you would see, obviously, Czechoslovakia or whoever was coming to Wembley, Holland. Wow, what a team they were. I remember seeing that on the telly and being amazed at how we couldn't hardly get a kick of the ball. Jan Peters, I think, scored a couple of goals in just before the 74 World Cup, that would have been probably. But So, you know, I have mixed memories, but that's the game that kind of sticks in my mind as uh, an outstanding technical game. And um, changed, I guess in a way, kind of changed my, my view of how the game would be played if it was slightly different in England. It changed it because of you enjoyed watching that or what I you I enjoyed the, the technical aspects of the game. And in England at that time, you've got to remember, technical wasn't really top no. of the agenda. In fact, the technical side of our game deteriorated from, uh, I would say, in around the late 80s to maybe 2000, somewhere in that period. This, you know, Hughes' doctoration of the FA had come through to all the coaching systems and everyone was playing long ball when it was aggressive and tough. And technical quality of the England game was uh, was somewhat reduced, I thought, by that. I didn't live in this country then, and I certainly don't want to be judgy or come across as judgy. But you know, I, I moved to Spain because of a love of a particular style of football, and it's been really rewarding just as a person um, experiencing this football. But if, if I, I find it really hard to understand that nobody st stood up or stopped Hughes and his. I think he was part of it was position of maximum opportunity and correct. And also, Jack Charlton is kind of deified in Ireland for, you can say it different ways, you can say Pomo, which is now, you know, you have to spit in the ground when you say it, but anywhere in Ireland, if you say put him under pressure, it's fantastic, and it was the same sort of idea which worked for his national team, but yeah, is, it, is there any idea how on earth it managed to spread and stay and not be a Pomo? Well, you have to remember, I took all my coaching badges under that regime. And it was so, I remember we used to speak at lunch, the coaches thinking, wow, this is not what I expected. Uh, you know, I really thought we'd be learning technical stuff here. And the actual learning on how to coach uh -huh. was quite good, I thought. Remember, Mr. Hughes employed a lot of school teachers and a lot of academics. And the actual to teach, to coach was quite good. Mm -hmm. It was just the subject matter that was yeah. completely, so senior pros, we were looking at each other, and a lot of senior pros, of course, wouldn't do them. So there was noises, but of course it was not being heard, and uh, we didn't really have a voice. We kind of done it, got our badges, and yeah. then decided to adopt whatever you see in that. My early career as a manager was somewhat influenced by that regime and Stevie Koppel, who had great success at Crystal Palace here, yep. doing that regime. I played under that regime. So the coaching syllabus in this country uh, was very poor. Does it hold any responsibility for the fact that all these years on, it can still be quite hard for even England teams with elite footballers that this country produces to to hold on to the ball in, in times, in tournaments, in the summer when it's hot, when it's a very unforgiving environment if you give it away, where other teams learn to punish you, where now the, the, the fine line between succeeding and failing is as thin as you can possibly imagine. Is there some correlation between what this country's still trying to get rid of and, and, and that those years of teaching, or, or do you think it's out of the system now? I wouldn't say it's out of the system. It slightly worries me that we don't play any competitive football until you get to the development group. 
So if you're under 16, under 14, there's no league table, there's no trophies. I think there's a cup you can win, the FA Youth Cup. That's about it. That worries me a little bit. So I still think there's some massive improvements to be made in our coaching syllabus and our way we bring our kids through. Mm. In terms of the Premier League, what the Premier League has given us is a view of the world close up. Rather than watching it on TV, it's in front of us now. Agueros, Tavez, they've all come through this system. We can name a thousand players who are from France, from Spain, from the South America, are all in the Premier League. And of course, it's influenced the game massively and coaches as well. And um, if that hadn't have happened, let's just say the Premier League hadn't have happened, we didn't get the finance for it. I really would worry where we, were, yeah. where, where we would be now. Because really and truly, the FA is slightly detached and has gone along and you know, improved a little bit, improved a little bit, improved a little bit. But it's been the influx of foreign coaches and foreign players that have influenced coaches like myself more so than anything I've picked up on any coaching course in England. And that is a slight worry. Before we develop that, because I think it's a lovely touch that you say that and the way in which your view on football and how you might coach it, how it might be played, to seeing a particular Frenchman you've got in your midfield, who I think is a very gifted footballer, very enjoyable to watch. And I know you've said he's also a super pro. But before we go there, you, you talked about lack of competitive play for under 16s and so on. Can I, can I take you back to your playing days before you hit the big time? Because there's a huge amount being made of Jamie Vardy rightly now, mm. fantastic. And it's a story that makes everybody happy. And I think it gives everybody hope. But it, to some degree, it echoes your story, it echoes Ian Wright's story. There are many others. One of Chris the interviews Waddle. we did here was Chrissy. And, and Chris, Chris I mean, about... Chris Waddle will do something that I don't think Vardy will do, well, he might do. You know, he won a Champions League medal. Well, Amazing. Chris, Chris the league. you know, he, he goes abroad. He's a very cultured man now. He brings that stadium you were in at the week. It was the velodrome, wasn't it? You were not Monaco. No, in the Marseille's new stadium. In Marseille's new stadium. So he, he brings the old velodrome to its knees in worship. And he was very funny about life over there. But basically, he's still a rock star there now. <laughs> but he was, you know, what he says, he was putting spice in sausages as, as a kid. He didn't believe in himself. He was rejected. He, he became a goalkeeper. He played amateur football and nearly didn't make it. And found the tr transition into even Newcastle's reserve set up really, really hard. But what was life like while you were, I don't think, were you even playing in, I don't know, Corinthians and Dulwich and whatever, thinking there's still a professional life in this for me? Or were you playing for the pleasure or for the boot money? Where were you at in, in that stage of your career? Well, bizarrely, I still felt that I was, should have been a pro. That kind of ate into me uh, through my twenties that I've been dealt a harsh hand a little bit, but it never really ate into me. It wasn't something that I would bore someone with, but it ate into me when I played. So I was always, whenever we played a pro team or we had a pre-season friendly against the pro team, I would be extra committed, extra letting them know that I should have signed me. <laughs> uh, but of course, when I look back on my time as a young player, I was actually technically pretty good. Not very good, but my body was weak. And my body didn't come to me till I was about 22. I didn't get any strength till I was 21, any kind of body strength. So I can understand why I missed the boat. So I wasn't bitter or twisted about it, or I just knew that I could do it. I just knew I'd played enough against enough good players, ex-pros who come into non-league, and in those games I was just telling you about, to know that I could do it. You know, at 25, I'm thinking, hmm, don't see it now. And then it arrived. So probably just as it was waning, that kind of desire and belief that it was going to happen, uh, it, it did happen. Before I ask you who Billy Smith is, what's the colour and the texture of life in those teams, in those leagues? Well, I always say this to players, the winning mentality never changes through any technical level I've played at. And I've played and managed, I would suspect, at every senior level in England. So I think I'm in a good position to say, <laughs> So, you know, I could be sitting with an accountant who went to uh, Oxford. I remember at Casuals, we had a couple of real old gentry still sort of hanging about. And, uh, but their desire to win was no, was no less than mine. 
So that doesn't change. So you've got to imagine, you put a group of guys together, they've been working, whatever, the winning mentality is there. The technical ability, of course, is not there. The fitness is not there. The preparation is not there. The organisation isn't there. But the winning mentality is there, and that shows its head in unbelievable ways at non-league sometimes. Sometimes I've been in teams that have a greater winning mentality than pro teams that I've managed even. So um, that is something that... Um, that transcends, but uh, my period in non-league was a great experience for my personality. I think if there was one thing that's helped me in management, I had an interesting night Saturday after our victory. I had my Sunday teens from when I was 20, Christmas drink, uh, those that are still alive, bless them. And uh, we was talking and I know I can handle most personalities, most situations, most uh, conversations because of my experience in non-league and the multitude and the fabric and the, of this great tapestry of people that comes through that world. What, so, what have these guys gone on to do? They've all gone on to do weird and different things. Some are now retired. One worked in the meat market and become hugely successful. He went from the shop floor to owning the company. I've had other guys who uh, become builders now own their own building company, advertising guys uh, who have done quite well, one or two have not done so well, the divorces and the usual family issues that go on and loss of job and, but of course, like a football team, what that brings you together, that's your cement, yeah. is your memories of your football team. So it was nice to have all those guys who, were, who have been successful and all those guys who haven't been successful meet and have, and have a shared agenda. It's quarter of a century now that you've been their big success story in football. If we could time machine ourselves back to then, would they have been surprised by something like this for Alan Pardew? Would, would they have seen that mentality and that the, the words you were using about I feel I should, you know, I, I'd been hard done by by football you were motivated by it, not bitter would they have seen anything like this for you then? I don't think so I think I genuinely always had kind of leadership qualities. I think that they could have seen in me. Yeah. I think they would have said, oh yeah, I think Pards will you know, be a manager of Sunday team, Saturday team, non-league team, to have gone on uh, where I've gone on. Of course, they could never have predicted that. And I couldn't have predicted it at that time. I had to change my knowledge uh, quickly. I had to kind of absorb a lot of professional knowledge quickly to become a coach. Mm. I had a lot of non-league knowledge and a lot of that winning mentality in me, but I needed to channel it into uh, something that had uh, a professional structure and organisation around it. I was a real kind of sponge when I come into the pro, pro game, whereas guys would go home after the training, I wouldn't, I'd hang about and listen and talk to coaches. Keith Peacock, when I was at Charm, was a big mentor of mine. John uh, Griffin, who was chief scout, he's still chief scout here, was chief scout at Crystal Palace then. I brought him back when I come here and uh, I would tap into him. What do you do? How does it work? Da, da, da. So I was a real, real kind of like, I knew it was a privilege for me to be in a pro game uh, at that stage. So there's no way I was going to let it slip. We have one mutual friend I spoke to. I didn't, I didn't speak to many, but he said, exactly. it's funny you mentioned Charlton. So you've got to guess who it is. He said, oh, brilliant motivator, brilliant motivator and clearly on the pitch, in the dressing room, in training, lifting people, going beyond his own performance. Really strong words. Billy Smith, am, am I right in thinking that Billy, I, I've never met, was, was a big influence in well, how, Billy, how, how Billy, you Smith, Billy Smith saw something in me at non-league level that uh, others uh, didn't see. And um, he transformed me as a non-league player into uh, a creative player and a player to influence his team in terms of leading the team and uh, being the kind of iconic figure in his team. So I have a great debt to him. He's uh, somebody that's been hugely successful at non-league level. Ian Wright come and play for us. We had Tony Finnegan, we had Andy Gray, we had myself, all players that he fed into Crystal Palace. Good names. Big names, yeah. And Andy uh, played at Marbella. Andy Gray, yes, Andy, right. I, I, was, I was on holiday and I watched him playing for Marbella and couldn't believe it. Yeah. And Tony 
went to Falkirk, if I'm right. Yes, that's right. And had a little spell up there. Ian Ray, he yeah. did okay for himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paul Harding, and an actual fact, me and Paul Harding played, whose name you might not be familiar with, but I remember he came into the pro game late. He played for Billy Smith. I was late. And then we kind of went different, you know, he went to pro and pro And then we ended up being captains, myself of Charlton and him of Cardiff. And we all looked at each other, we shook hands in the middle of the pitch, and I went, it's strange, isn't it? Here we are. <laughs> Football's beautiful like that, yeah, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's right, as those moments, doesn't it? Yeah. I think it's what it makes it. I think as much as seeing a winning goal at San Siro and suddenly lifting the cup with big ears, I think that's the, the mm. beautiful tapestry of football as far as happens to human stories yes, and right. success, yep. particularly against the odds. So I think he, Billy, maybe rec- recommends you to either Stevie Coppel or yeah. Ron Rhodes, and you're here. Yeah, so uh, pivotal game, really. I played for Dulwich against, uh, for Billy, against Yeovil, and uh, the manager that you might remember that played for Manchester City, Jerry Gow. Oh, yeah. Uh, played for was, Bristol as well, didn't yeah, he? Bristol big, City. Oh, big yeah. Bristol City. And he was now manager of Yeovil, player manager, and I destroyed him. I mean, I literally <laughs> ran all over him. And uh, to his credit, he didn't take it as an insult. He decided to sign me. So I ended up at Yeovil and uh, enjoyed it. But of course, I was working. I was up at seven, midweek game. So I'd just go for a midweek game at Yeovil and we'd play every week, every midweek, because, you know, Yeovil was like the Manchester United of non-league. So we had Western Cup, Isthmian Cup, league games. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I had a midweek game every week. So seven o'clock would get up. I would work hard. Sometimes have about ten minute lunch period, so I could finish at quarter to three. Get in my car, drive to Yeovil. Hope, fingers crossed, that three o three was a nice dozer in the winter. Touch and go. Touch and go. Get there late a few times. Play a game. Get in my car. Drive back for two and a half hours. Arrive home. I don't know half 12, one o'clock, sometimes later, and then, and then start work the next day. Mm-hmm. And it was on one of those journeys home in midwinter when I was driving home and bizarrely, the same had happened in the road and there was cones literally everywhere. So someone had banged them or something, mm-hmm. pushed them around and he got stuck under my front wheel. I spun around about eight times in my car, ended up in a ditch, no, not a scratch on the car, not a scratch on me. It really was like, oh, I can't let this, I can't do this. Yeah. And I kind of went back to Yeovil and said, look, I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Transfer list and uh, Palace decided to come for me. Those two things were kind of pivotal uh, in, in me getting to pass, Palace. You know, I spoke to, I, uh-huh. I don't want to name him on this, but I spoke recently to, to a Premier League player who, who spent some of his holidays working with friends who are joining us because he's obsessed with creating something, doing something practically. His hands. Now that's not what you did, but you were very successful and very good at what you were doing. And was there any doubt about commercially? What to there choose? was a doubt because when Ron offered me two hundred pound less than I was getting as a builder and, a, and as a player, but let's not. That was a lot of joke. money. Then that was a lot. Now of money. you can laugh about it, but that's a big decision. Yeah, I really kind of. I was like, I was pleading with him to say, look, you know, come on, I. Uh, almost twice this what I'm getting anyway I decided to, to take a chance he promised me they'd look after me if I did well what influenced that was good enough you? for me what, 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 what swung the decision for you there was no decision he really and truly could probably offered me £100 a week and I was signed <laughs> so it didn't really matter but it did matter because at that time I'd committed to a house I had a car so I had certain things I had to pay for so but he was good to his word. He looked after me. You know, I, I didn't do well for the first sort of six months. It took me a while to break in. Once I broke in and did well, he, he gave me a new contract. So, you know, he was good to his word. At what stage did you pinch yourself? Because I don't know how many times. You must have talked a million times about scoring semi-final goal. But even, I guess, in the build-up to knocking teams out and then playing Liverpool in the semi-final, there must have been a moment... I don't know, was it, probably there wasn't any self-doubt once you'd gone that far, but was there a moment when you thought, well, this is just utterly fantastic? The accumulated things that come with it, the pressure, I don't know if you did grandstand or bombarded with people asking for tickets, these must have been quite new experiences at that stage. Well, we was, uh, what is now, would have been a championship side, 
when I arrived and uh, we had Wright and Bright, so that was handy um, <laughs> because um, it gave us a chance for success. And behind those two really were like warriors. I mean, Steve Koppel chose a few warriors to play in that team, but not bad warriors. And I actually found my feet in the promotion push. We had a couple of injuries and I'd secured the central position and it was the playoff game against Blackburn Rovers to get us promoted that really gave me the confidence to think definitely I can play. All through that summer, the speculation in the local paper here was of course to replace me. I was the one that had to go out of the team to take them forward to be a Premier League team. And in, in the heart of hearts, I probably thought, mm, it's probably right, uh, you know, but I ain't gonna let it happen. Yeah. So that first, uh, season and we obviously went to Liverpool and got beat nine was actually a good period for me. I kind of was doing quite well, although our results were indifferent. Mm -hmm. So it turned out to be a pivotal period, culminating in the in the semi final, of course. What was the job then? You you, you, know, you talked about warrior players, but you know you could play, you could read the game. And Steve was also a, a guy who liked football when he could have it. I know you had two very good footballers in front of you. But as a midfield, what was your job? Well, ironically, I kind of started when I was at school and uh, I was a defender, so defensive midfield player. And, believe, and when I went to non-league, I became a creative player because obviously my technical level was above what I was playing at school. Really so I was in district team and all yeah. that. And Anyway, I became a, a kind of number 10 uh, in non-league. And then when I went to pro, I realized that my technical level wasn't good enough to be a number 10. So I dropped back and become a defensive midfield player, really, uh, with legs uh, to go and nick a goal now and again. And that really was my job. But the other side of my job, which Stevie Copper was very good at, was to man mark. So if there was a job that he, he wanted done in that midfield, that was my job. So Gasco and I had to mark man to man a couple of times, Brian Robson a couple of times, Steve McMahon at Liverpool. John Barnes at Liverpool. So that would be my particular role to make sure. And I was very concentrated on that aspect of the game. I wasn't somebody that um, you could give a job to and I would be flippant about it. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like that, you know, do the garden, I'll, I will do the garden. <laughs> you know, I'll make sure it's all in lines and it's in, I'm sort of got that OCD about me even my desk and everything around me, my files, and it's all pretty, pretty tight. I have to say it's blooming impressive, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's just the way my makeup is. So, of course, but I also had to be tactically aware of times when to not man mark and when to release from that job. And I think that helped me become, a, as a coach, become, uh, understand uh, for players that there is a game plan, there is a, Mm -hmm. There is a, a certain things that you do need to do, but then there's also jobs that you have to kind of follow your instincts. And I've always been good coaching flair players. It's probably my asset. I don't know why that is. Might have something to do with that, but that is something that um, I can give them jobs. I can give them what they where they need to be in certain situations, but also be able to give them that freedom and. It might come back from, it might be a centre of my playing days, but that's, that's something I'm good at. There are many transitions that you watch on a pitch and they're, they're increasingly easy to understand. Like the modern trend is to take a winger and teach him how to be a wing back. Maybe even just a full back. And I think quite often you can see players with the intelligence and the reading of game that they can oscillate between playing next to a centre half, whether you want to call it a sweeper or a libero or play in the middle of an organising you know, well, room. I mean, you know, what you're talking about is a player that turned up for me uh, on, uh, in, a, in a very difficult circumstance was Mascarano. Mm. There's this guy um, who's a fantastic passer, possibly the, the safest passer I ever see, Just other than Michael Carrick. I'd put them two very similar in their passing technical ability. Could I see him as a centre half? No. To this day, I still can't see him as a centre right. Thank the Lord you said that. Yeah, and there's probably only one team in the world yeah. that could play him as a centre half. So it was amazing that uh, he, he ended up there. I've watched him. My, my knowledge is, my eye is, is 
not yours, not as good. When Pep first did it, it was auxiliary because on the night of the Wembley final, Puyol's not fit. Abidal's back from a cancer scare, but as Abidal's told me in a film that we're making, didn't expect, I was shocked out of his skin that he was playing. And you think, Mascherano won't cope, and he copes then. But when it's day after day after game after game after game, he was exposed. Positionally, a bit rash, height. Yeah. If you would suck the juice out of what you've said about the age of 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, he's done that, he's gone, right, I'll tell you what I learned from that. We'll learn from that as well, I'll learn from that. Right. To the point at which now, mm, you know, half bad. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and suddenly he's comfortable. Yeah. But I mean, okay, you, you've picked up beautifully on what I'm saying that he didn't look like a natural, but you could, you know, Carrick's played in the centre at the back and in midfield. You can ask, you could ask PK to do that easily. Busquets has done it, okay. But across the game, there are certain positions. But when you change from somebody who'd been a creative player, a bit of time on the ball, vision about where to put a pass, a 10-ish type of player, to a player who goes one-on-one -on -one with some of the greats of that age of English football, that's a big transition. What's it like? Because when you're 10, a lot of the time, or a creative midfielder, a lot of the time, there's only you in your head. There's the ball, I've read it, it's what I want to do with it. Where's my space? What does he not like to... Suddenly, you know, it's... Clips it's the around. Fury. It's, yeah. There's two of you in, in, in that, in your mm. space, in your head. And what was it like, Gaza, Robson, Barnes? And how well, did you Gaza, manage it? Gaza was, uh, was a tormentor. Gaza would uh, go out of his way to kind of humiliate uh, any player. That was his style. You know, he was brilliant. But I wouldn't leave him. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a good expression. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't leave him alone. So we had a kind of uh, funny relationship. And he's not, he, he was, uh, let's just say he's verbally, uh, he was verbally enhanced <laughs> like myself. So we had some uh, interesting debates on the pitch. Uh, but he was funny. I always enjoyed playing against him. But I remember at Crystal Palace, he ran me across the pitch. He had the ball at his feet and he was dragging it with one and towing it with the other foot and he went all the way across the pitch. They were winning at the time. And I could hear the crowd la not laughing, kind of chuckling, like, you know, you can at a game, you know, yeah. and like, like oh. and I, but I didn't move. I just didn't make a tackle. I just followed him across the pitch. And when he passed it, I said, well done. And we carried on playing and he wow. laughed. Wow. And, that was, and that was just how I was at that time. I was just like motorized in my mind that that was the job I had to do. And I guess, like, I, didn't, I didn't see the incident, but as you described it, because you were doing a job and, and taking the, the fact that around there was a bit of a free zone around the ground, it probably wasn't going anywhere that dangerous either, was it? It, it no, kind of looked no, exactly. okay, but you had done your job. Exactly. You know, at the end of the game, uh, I remember a few of the Palace, but uh, about one guys that took you across the pitch. And to be honest, I wasn't even, it doesn't even embarrass me. I don't even now, I think, even Brighty, I've heard him say it a couple of times, bring it up as a sort of, you know, a funny story. I'd love to see a clip of it again, because I know it didn't bother me in the slightest. And that's, uh, and that's kind of how my mentality had become by then. I was really kind of like focused on uh, what my job was and what Steve Copper wanted me to do. And that was it. That wasn't what I had to do. You, you, you very nearly robbed Alex Ferguson of his first trophy. You know, the, the breakthrough moment for Alex, of yeah. modern football in England. Yeah. The breakthrough well, moment. There have been dynasties, but let's see Crystal Palace win that cup. You know, we should have won it. And um, I remember going down the tunnel. I walked down the tunnel quite early and Alex was outside his dressing room. He was waiting for his players to come in and one or two had already arrived and he was, you know, ushering them in. I could see the relief. I remember going in our dressing room saying he can't believe how lucky he is. We should have won that, guys, you know, and make sure we do it the second time, which we, which we made a bit of a mess of. But, um, yeah, it was one of those moments in time when, and all great managers have them, you could even argue Mourinho on the touchline against Old Trafford. It might not have worked out like that. Shouldn't have, either. Offside. And it shouldn't have. Yeah. So, you know, great managers still have to, you still need the breaks now and again. You could say you have to earn them or whatever reason or your preparation was such etc etc but you still need the breaks I'm sure we've lost some unbelievably great managers because that when it, didn't that fall, day no. didn't go that particular day you've tantalised me because and do, I've had do, a few you, do you have a view of why that is that sometimes the, the dice do fall for for these guys 
Is it character? Is it how hard you work? Do, do you have a view? You know, famously Jack Stewart said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. But it's, it's a misnomer. He didn't actually mean, he was taking the, he was taking the piss of my podcast, I didn't say that. He's saying, no, 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 the, the thing you think was luck wasn't luck. But a manager can't influence the fact that Benny's free I kick know. spills and Costinho's offside and the remember, linesman doesn't give it. I remember managing Reading Football Club and I'd done okay up until this point and we went and we was leading 3 nil at half time and I needed to win this game to save my job at Notts County. At 82 minutes, it was free all and I'm thinking, and they had a chance and I thought, if that goes in, that's me. And forget where I'm sitting now, forget it. That, forget it, that it's not gonna happen. And yeah, I prepared the team. Yeah, I worked hard, of course. Like all, every other manager prepared and worked hard. Yeah. And we went up the other end and scored <laughs> against the run of play and won the game. And everyone went, oh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> it was all designed Isn't by the first time I, in any of these interviews, I wish that was 10 seconds of visual because yeah, exactly. your hand and the smile and the ruefulness and the, that was beautiful expression. Yeah. So that's, and, uh, and pivotal moments at Newcastle I had when um, I could have lost my job. I also feel I could have won the Europa League at Newcastle because the game against Benfica, Benfica game was, we should have won. Yeah, easily. Ben Arthur has a chance for 2-0 for before they score and it would have been game over. They wouldn't have come back from that. They went on to the final, obviously, against Chelsea. So, you know, you get moments. The FA Cup final, I'm looking at Benitez on the sideline as a manager. He's done. I can see him. He, he knew he was preparing his speech for the defeat. And then literally a, a football miracle happens. And well, have you ever seen these are moments that change careers? Now, if I'd have won the uh, Cup, FA Cup then, where would I be now? What would my personality be different? It might be completely different. Bit of glory at that stage, going on to a big club, uh, success or not success, I might not be where I am now. So these things sometimes happen for a reason. I don't actually think it's in the gods or in the, I think sometimes it's just fate. Mm. Yeah, I can't determine uh, an actual fact. So there we go back to what I used to do at Bristol Palace. Because Peter Grant whispered in my ear with 10 minutes to go, just get Nigel Rio Coca to man mark Stevie Gerrard and we've done it, right? Oh. And I went, because I'm not stupid, that was a good idea. So we man marked Stevie Gerrard. And if you watch the game, because now I'm telling you, you'll know, you watch the last seven or eight minutes of that game, Nigel Rio Coca was all over him like a rash. And Stevie Gerrard decided to drop off deep because he wasn't influencing the game, he wasn't getting a kick. And Nigel Rio Coca, being the honest pro that he was, stayed deep to, Defends the space. to, to prevent the back four. Stevie Gerrard picks it up and shoots from another country, yards. basically. So there you go. So we did everything right. I could look back, I still look back on that time and that goal, and I could see it now. And I, I don't blame Nigel Rio Coca, because if it was me, I'd have done exactly the same as him. That was a natural instinct yeah. that he had to do, was protect the back four, not go and mark Stevie Gerrard. You weren't going to do nothing from there. Goal goes in. So, you know, these, uh, the, all these things are linked. That's what's great about football. I can see moments when great managers have moments in their career. I've seen Angelotti lose when he perhaps should have won and won when he should have lost. I've seen Jose win when he should have lost. Jose lose when he should have won. So these defining moments, and as you say, you're quite right, they're getting finer actually. Mm -hmm. And particularly in league we're in, they are really fine now. Mm -hmm. We have won seven, lost six. We've actually won more games than Tottenham and Everton, but we've lost six games. And actually, we could have won the six and lost the seven. Mm -hmm. We are in there. That's what's good about us. We're a good team and we fight and we're a real fighting team. We're in there all the time. We win or we lose. We ain't got that real control of the game. That's something we've got to get, hopefully, in the next second part of the season. I feel um, that when we're turning, this is only my view as an observer, and the reason we're privileged to be here is that you've done this and learned from it. When I watch, one of the things I learn that, that counter twists the kaleidoscope when you've had the ready moment at 3-0, 3-3, oof, they haven't scored and then we scored and then you've had 
we got it just right. We're going to protect the 3 2 FA Cup final. We can put the right man on the right man, and it still doesn't work out. And in moments like that, what I think I've learned is, is, is what you do afterwards. And my memory is, and I think it's under, probably underwritten as a Crystal Palace team, not long after the Cup final, maybe 12 months, you go back to Wembley, don't you? And beat Everton. Mm. Thump. Yeah, fact, we thump did. a very good Everton side. Yeah. And people don't, I think it was the Football League trophy. Yeah, was it we, we actually, we should have been in Europe because May United were already in Europe yeah. that year, but it was the year we got banned. Yeah. So the FA and who, the FA were in charge, weren't they, the top division at the time, decided to create this competition like another League Cup, basically. Yeah. And that's what we won. Um, I can't remember. Zenith Data, I think it might yeah. have been called. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, no, we was, we was actually a better team the year after. I didn't play, I was a, like first sub really in them days. You only had two subs. I was pretty much getting games here and there, but I wasn't See, first team. I think you played in the final. Yeah, I played in the final, yeah. yeah. No, I played my share, but we finished. I'm, uh, seriously, looking at that Everton side, yeah. it's a right well, We finished third 11. in the league that year. Crystal Palace. Third. I mean, that takes some doing. I'm never going to top that. But Stevie Cottle don't get any credit for that because it wasn't Premier League. We're all about the Premier League now. Premier League stats and like we got, oh, we, we broke the record on Saturday. 5-1, first time uh, we won 5-1. I'm pretty sure if you go back to Stevie Cottle in the first division, he's got a five in there. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure of that. And a third place. And a third place. Yeah. It's extraordinary actually, yeah. isn't it? When you look yeah. back on it. Yeah, it was. Beca because, okay, it wasn't the Premier League with all its beautiful marketing and its clever organisation and but his football was still a bit bumpy then. You know, the hooliganism was still a problem, whatever. Maybe if people are unfairly expunging those days, it's because it brings with it. But that's no less of an achievement, in fact. No, that's right. So the teams were at least as good. In fact, in my opinion, teams were better then. I well, think. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, I look at the teams from fifth down and they are better. And yet I look at the teams fifth up and I don't think they're as good as they were. Quality-wise, I think we're talking about... Yeah, correct. Maybe creativity, intelligence. Oh, they're bigger clubs now. Wow, the, look at 282 million for 13% of Man City today. But you, you don't pay Chinese for your club. ticket when you're punting. You don't pay for your ticket to see size of their budget. No, of or course. well our account of course. dress. Of course. You pay to see the footballers. Of course. So some of the great sides we've had in this country, the Liverpool side that cleaned up, Alex Ferguson's two United teams, you could argue, three. The Arsenal team of Wenger's, the Invincibles. We ain't got a team like that at the moment. No. Even Chelsea last year. People would say to me about uh, Jose, you know, struggling this year, but they struggled for the last two months of last season. They literally crawled over the line. Everyone was going, oh, they've lost a little bit of spark. They were hanging on for that title and they managed to do that. You've got a friend there. I learned when I first came over to meet you really properly at Newcastle's training ground, you said to me, no, I've got somebody there who you were talking about, he would probably help you in the market where I think you've proved to be very good with whatever network of help. I think you've got a tremendous eye, tremendous appetite for detail, which is fantastic. But what's the background of, being, of having a friend in Mourinho? Because that's some years now. It must have been from when you first went up against each other in his first year at Chelsea, am I right? Yeah, we, pro we probably um, had a connection with Brendan Rodgers, who was my academy director at Reading, and ended up being um, obviously an assistant to, to Jose at uh, Chelsea. So that helped. I think Brendan probably uh, told him a few stories and you know, he must have liked what he heard. So he was sort of pre-armed before he met me. But I've always, liked his character uh, and I do and I think unfortunately Jose you know um, has this way of playing with the press at times that was always going to hurt him if it went bad and that's what's happening <laughs> uh, but I, I mean I'm not I'm not I'm but, not here for the no but everybody he, can draw their own conclusions about what he does and says what he what can't escape is his talent you know, and what you can't underestimate is his ability to keep a team focused. 
particularly when they get in winning positions. You know, you talk about golfers who get in winning positions. You say like McIlroy, once he gets up there, you go, oh, forget it. You know, you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna claw him back. Mm -hmm. And Spieth, you can look at him and say the same. And Tiger in, in win Tiger's day. This is like football teams, Jose's teams like that. When they get their noses in front, they're very, very difficult. There's not many times I can think of he's been pipped at the post. It ain't happening. Once he gets his nose in front, that's an art to keep the team as motivated and organised and everything right to the wire and get the title and get the cut. Apart from many things about his achievements to admire, one of the things that's been patently clear, and he, he's always been able to get under people's skin, get under the skin of his players, mm. make them believe more, play better, enjoy themselves more, create a team spirit. Sometimes the circling of the wagons, but not quite like Fergie did when it was literally non-stop for a quarter of a century, everybody's against us. He sold this false suit to the players and they bought it every... <laughs> it was brilliant work, brilliant work. You know, he could be on the back of a wagon in the Wild West selling hair tonic and people, you know, everybody would have bought it, including the buffalo. But Josie seems to have this um, really good one-on-one -on -one skill to, to lift a man, lift a player, and maybe make him better. Make him believe. Is, listen, the psychology of a footballer these days is, is your big battle because I look at coaches and I look at setups and I look at tactics and, and I look at all that and I think, yeah, you're probably, we're probably on the same page there on that one. Mm -hmm. So where's the difference going to come? Well, it's about what you're going to do at half time, what you're doing before the game as a manager, where are you going to lift them? It really goes undetected a little bit by the media, in my opinion. What managers are like in that dressing room, because I can talk about Sven Goran Eriksson as an Englishman managing him, managing English players. I could never see it. A lack of cultural connection in <coughs> how to see, express I, I couldn't see what I couldn't see something on telly about him. I couldn't see in him when I spoke to him privately, see him on TV, what he would have done for me in the change room that would have really made me go the extra mile. Now, I could reel off. Sam Allardyce, Terry Venables, George Graham, Jose Mourinho, Alec, Brendan Rodgers, all those people, there's something about them that would, I know could touch me as a player. And I couldn't see it with him. So that's looking at it in that kind of scale of that is what I think the modern manager has got to be really at the top of his tree. How do you reach players? How do I reach Zaha? How do I reach Scotty Dan? completely two different characters from complete, two completely different backgrounds. But you go, that's your job. That is your job. And if there's one art that Alex Ferguson had that um, sets him apart at times was that he could reach every player in all the time that he managed, because it was an incredible long period that he managed. And he, and he changed. And he, I remember him telling me the story of Roy Keane when Roy Keane came in to see him. He'd left Roy Keane out, Roy Keane wasn't happy. And I'm not surprised, you know, I can imagine Roy Keane knocking on my door. <laughs> and, uh, and Alex said to me that he knocked on his door and he said, look, you know, you've changed, you have. You know, and uh, I don't like that. And Alex Ferguson turned around to him and said, yeah, of course I've changed. I've changed because the game's changed. You've got to change with the game. My, my management's changed. The way I view the game has changed. Maybe you should look at that. And that's true. That's so true. And um, unfortunately, the problem you have at Premier League, or no, actually not Premier League, managing at a professional level is senior players coming to the end of their career, actually not realising that you are trying to do the right thing by them. They think that you're doing everything wrong for them. It might be that you've changed, you know, that you're trying to take the team forward and that they now become a byproduct. They mm -hmm. can't accept that byproduct. Can't accept it. They can't see this new vision, this new look. They can't get it. When I speak to other managers and the problems I've had, really and truly, some of my worst experiences are those senior players. The same senior players who come up to me now at functions, now I'm a little bit older and say, you were right. And you know what? You were one of the best managers and blah, blah, blah. And I didn't see it at the time. And I'm sorry, I apologize. You know, I get all those little things and I think, I don't hold it against them. I understand it because when I was a player, I was the same. I didn't see it either. When I got left out at Charlton, I was like, what's he doing curvishly? He's got this all wrong. You don't see it. So you, for two or three years, 
you're blind at the end of your career. Com almost completely blind. It feels like a natural progression, though, because see that guy you've, you've trusted to take these... Not all players, by the way. Not all senior not players. Not understood. But, but, but a percentage. Let's say that senior player X is a guy who you've trusted to bring on young kids during your time. He's a guy to whom you've devolved a lot of responsibility in the pitch. He's a guy who's clicked with your ideas and understands your strategy and he feels actually sort of quite umbilically linked to you. Correct. And then that moment comes along where you're like, no, nah, not this Wednesday or not this game or not away from home or you need more time to recuperate or I'm, I'm changing the shape. And, and it's just automatic that, that the pride and the diligence and the competitive nature that's given you all that stuff in the first place has to go head to head into what you're saying and then it has to be a, a, a minor you've breakdown got, in, you've got to understand in the love. In, in a way you adopt a child really yeah. a new player yeah. you adopt a player and you abandon them and they think for all the wrong reasons yeah. that you've abandoned them and they're hurt and they're hurt I, I, and it, and it, I know two men in football don't usually use that vocabulary but I've never managed them but I've spoken to players and there is just a how could he yeah, or, yeah. or I, I've been let down, or that's not fair. And yeah. if they were allowed to go into a corner and cry for 10 minutes. Yes. It's a natural human reaction. They're still getting paid as much, more or less, the majority of them. I, I could give you an example of name and name, and I have no embarrassment about naming the name because the guy is a champion. Shola Amiobi, who should have scored the winner for Bolton last night <laughs> uh, when he spun. Shola, when I went into Newcastle, the first season was massive important for me keeping the Premier League. We'd lost uh, the big fella to Liverpool for 30 million. Yeah. Shola had to come in. The fans didn't really particularly launch Shola in the team at that point, but he did an unbelievable job. And I've had to leave him out. Could have played him on many occasions for Newcastle, left him out. And I know Shola was looking at me to say, what, why? And yet I offered him his coaching job last year because I knew he, he understood, he could understand. It, it's kind of a strange love that you can have mm -hmm. as a positive and as a negative. Mm -hmm. And I was, I'm saying to Shola, you've got to go into management, you've got to. Don't not miss that boat. It might be a better boat than your playing career. Because my managing career, of course, has been more successful than my playing career. There's no doubt about that. I was always had more tools for this job than I did as a player. Same as Shona Amiobi. And I've got a few other players in the, who are like that. Malky Mackay. Malky is a great man manager. Got passion in the dressing room. Can reach players. Mm -hmm. So now I have all these ex-players who are coaches, managers, pundits or whatever they are. And uh, it's lovely bumping into them because their version of the same story is slightly <laughs> different. I listen I think... Oh, was it really like that? <laughs> you know, but sometimes you do get lost as a player and as a manager, by the way. And there has been times, some senior players, I have probably let down because I was under pressure yeah. or uh, it, was just, it, uh, it was just not going well. And I was having to be a bit meaner and tougher than perhaps I should have been with that particular senior player. So it hasn't always been one-sided, I get that. And there has been a few senior players that I've but when they tell me their version of the story, I go, you know what? Probably right there. Should have abandoned that. You can't better. live in everybody's head all the time when you're Correct. best year. And I, I don't really want to dwell on it too much because I'm here because I, I hugely admire what I think is a gently underestimated managerial career. And one which I think is, has probably barely even reached the glass half full. I, I imagine seeing the way that you evolve, seeing the way that you man-manage, which is a skill that can never be lost. Um, I imagine that there's more to come, probably cups. I'd imagine that a cup is a name here at Crystal Palace. But if I can touch on the Newcastle thing compared to where you are now, it must be hell of a good not to feel as if you're fighting against the negativity of the fans and the media at a club where nonetheless the results were superb. And how do you value the fifth for Newcastle with finishing third as a player with Crystal Palace. There's not a lot between those two achievements. But now, I often wonder, at Palace the crowd can't help you with strategy, they can't help you get the players fit more quickly, they can't help you winkle more money out of the owner. But to be with the communion of that power of a fan base must give you something that you get a buzz off energy-wise, but also, and conviction of, but also you can peddle that to the players, whether they're coming or whether they're 
trying hard and training. Well, of course, that's a major beneficial aspect of me managing this football club. It's dangerous for me because when you've been kind of an icon as a player at a football club to come back and manage it, there are going to be times when that icon status is going to get forgotten, for sure. And that is going to happen for me here at some point because you can't have continued success at a football club. And I never had continued success at Newcastle, but I did have success at Newcastle. Perhaps some success that they, uh, they took for granted a little bit. I, I honestly thought when we finished fifth, some of the local media was like, well, this is where we should be. And I was thinking, well, hold on a minute. We've hardly spent a penny compared to the clubs we've finished above here. And it's going to be a problem going forward uh, unless we can really throw some investment at this. And it turned out to be a problem. Although I think the connection uh, of me being from London and the owner who wasn't particularly popular, him being from London, they put that together. Uh, but really, I was the manager of Newcastle. I was employed by Mike Ashley. When you're a manager of a football club, you're a manager for the fans. You're trying to give them what they want. Mm. Mike never rung me and said, play five at the back today. Never, never, never. I tried to put on that pitch at Newcastle, an entertaining team. At times, it wasn't, for sure. At times, we struggled. We lost players to injury. We didn't invest enough. And uh, for all those reasons, we had some sticky periods. But, you know, my last game there, I remember I knew this was, there was a possibility this might open up for me, this place. And we played Everton and we won. We was ninth in the Premier League. And I looked at the press the next day and, I, and the social media. Because social media is a massive part of the feeling of the group. So you it shouldn't be you, you can't get away from it, I'm afraid. Yeah. It's the same here. Social media plays a big part now. Looked at it. It was almost like, well, we're underperforming and I thought it was overperforming mm. with what we had, with the players that we mm -hmm. had. So really, I knew it was probably the best time for them to give them a new start and uh, me to move on. But when coming to this place, of course, and where we are right now, it is very attractive to players. To sell it to Kabai was easy. I'm the manager here. I'm making all the big decisions with the owner, who has tremendous faith. He was with me when we met Johan. We have a fan base that's right behind us. We have... Uh, and, and noisy, which is now noisy. not a given. Even in the Premier League, it's not the thing anymore. And we're London. Yeah. You know, and it has, its, it has great attributes for a professional footballer. Access to home from London is easy, whether you live in Buenos Aires or you live in Windsor. It's incredible, isn't it? The, the life of the more they have to... Th can I be there? Can I be back? in two days and, yeah. and in and out. If the manager gives me two days, it's really incredible, their lifestyle, isn't it? Yeah. I think players are much more professional now. Their preparation, the way they go about their application makes it so much easier for managers like myself these days. I really don't need to worry about preparation and application of their fitness and their eating habits. That is now 90% of my players is on the money. I have to worry about where they are in their spirit. And what you're touching on, what you're saying about Newcastle and Crystal Palace, of course, was a major shift for myself because there's no way I could say my spirit was high at Newcastle at the end. It wasn't. They'd bang me down, bang my spirit down. It wears you, doesn't it? Yeah, and, I'm, and I am a lot of, my management is about my spirit and my, and my front foot and let's, come on. We can do it, we can overachieve. Because you transmit that. That's what I'm about. So of course, this environment was perfect for me. I knew it would be perfect for me. I'm still pinching myself where we are now to when I first arrived here. As I said to you, this training ground and the way it is now is, if you'd have taken a snapshot of it a year ago, you wouldn't believe what you're looking at now. So, you know, we've come a long, long way. And the team is leading the charge. So our academy is, we've got I wouldn't even want to take this in my academy venue. It's not ready. It's not done. It's not right for a Premier League team. So the first team is leading this club and all the infrastructure is going to have to come off the back of the first team winning games. If we can stay in the division this year, of course, the academy is going to get a nice big boost. Financially, it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. And presumably for a club like this, although however long you stay here, I know you have, is, is, I said it before, so I won't repeat, but an ability in the market, an ability to spot the right guy, weed out the guys who look right but aren't, 
then to make the deal well, to understand the pitfalls in a deal. And therefore, that's what Crystal Palace probably need at the moment. But if you can have, add to the community spirit, and have guys coming through who've spent four, five, ten years in an academy, and then they're wearing the badge here, the power of that, I'd imagine, must be, could be phenomenal. Once that's put right. This club never been better poised to become a big club than it is now. Mm -hmm. Never been a big club. I can say that because I've played here. So I know that my fans won't take umbrage with that. They'll understand. Of course, it's yeah. not a big club, but this club could be a big club. Mm -hmm. We have new investment, which could push us on. The biggest thing we got going for us, we're playing in a Premier League, which is 40% financially stronger than any other division in the world. Uh, and we're in London and therefore we are a very commoditable product and we just need to uh, realise our potential. I'm saying to the guys this year that the potential in the team should give you the belief, let alone the potential in the club, that we can do something this year. And I think they do believe me. I'm getting them to believe me. And the next period, the next two months, we pivotal to where we finish. Well, I hope it's in a position that earns the club lots of money. I won't even get you in the Europa League because we'll never see eye to eye. <laughs> it's European football. It's a potential trophy. You nearly won it once. But maybe we'll see you at uh, Wembley in May. Well, I think um, the, the cups for us are going to be important in the next three years mm. because I like to think we're going to be in a position to have that quirk of fate fall our way. Uh, because <laughs> if Alex Ferguson thinks a big slice of his fortune was down to good luck, which I've, I know he does, uh, then uh, even uh, lesser mortals like myself need a little <laughs> bit of it. So we hope to have a bit of luck uh, in the next three years. But, you know, next time um, you come here, it'd be nice for me to take you around our new academy, show you that it's as good as this, and then we'll have a club we can be proud of. Because at the minute, the infrastructure of the club just letting us down a little bit. And it isn't lost on the chairman and not lost on the owners of this football club to put that right. Not to the level of Manchester City or Man United, but certainly to the level of a, a West Ham or a Everton or a, a Stoke uh, who have been in the Premier League 10 years or whatever. Success. The top team in the academy is always driven from the top down before the lieutenants at ground level can make things right. My opinion is the club's in the right hands with you. Couldn't be better. Maybe the Eagles so high. Uh, um, it's been a pleasure. I'm going to say, like I said at the beginning, this has been a pleasure. You've lived this life and for us, we just get to sample a little bit of it and boy, the adrenaline's flowing. A joy, a joy Good. to speak to you. Top man. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if it came through in the audio, but that's the first interview that we've done of all of these that I really wished that we'd filmed. Alan's a really expressive guy, and there were a couple of times when he was not lost in his own thoughts, but deep in the anecdote, where he would move and change his facial expression uh, really vigorously in order to help get the point across. And um, given the fact that we were perched in his HQ, overlooking the training ground, treated fabulously, about to have a nice lunch in the training ground canteen, it was a very good day. Overall, I hope that you got a feeling for Alan Pardew as a guy rather than simply as the ex-Reading or Southampton or West Ham or Newcastle manager, the current Crystal Palace boss. I think something special is happening there. I imagine the fans must be ecstatic to have him managing that team at a time when the ownership was attracting new money. Crystal Palace, club on the rise. The FA Cup came up as a theme there. Guess what the draw says? Yeah, in a couple of weeks' time. His Crystal Palace against his former club, Southampton. Should be fun. A big deal now, an important thing. I said at the start what a fantastic year 2015 has been for the three of us, Neil, Martin and I. But without your support, we wouldn't be continuing. And therefore, there's shout outs. Of the 1,184 of you who backed us financially, some bought shout outs, including John McIver, Gavin Ray and Tim Jenkins. So to John, Gavin and Tim, I have to say, you're socios, you're members, you're in the gang, you're part of the big interview, you didn't simply feed back to us that you enjoyed listening, you did something, you did something active, you spent hard-earned cash, 
I think that's something that inspires us. It's very valuable. I treat every penny that everybody is willing to prize loose from their wallet as a really big vote of confidence. And all of us, Backpage Press and I, Alex Beer Jacket, especially me, I have to say, on the voice that you hear, I have to do the interviews. We really appreciate your support. And if we were Jurgen Klopp, we'd make you all join hands with us and hold on, salute ourselves because there are no fa- No, that isn't working. But I feel about you the way that Klopp feels about the Gelp wall at uh, Dortmund and is trying to feel about Anfield. Dudes, thanks for the support. Get your name on the mailing list. It's free at grahamhunter.tv. You do that, we'll tell you about everything that we're up to. We'll do blogs. We'll try to give you exclusive content, certainly first notice of things. It's on that site, grahamhunter.tv, that you can also buy my books on FC Barcelona and on the Spain Trophy treble, two of the great footballing stories of my career, I think. All of this is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. The music by Beer Jacket. That's a very talented musician there. He has a big back catalogue. It's worth finding it, listening to it, and buying it. Finally, Alex Aidy, you're a star. You look after us. You teach us new things. Audio Boom and you have been great supporters over recent months and weeks. Thanks for your excellent, excellent skill. You're a talented woman. If you're one of the 1,184 people who backed our Kickstarter campaign, thank you so much. If you're not, but you want to contribute to the ongoing good health of this show, The Big Interview, please leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this and tell your friends about us. It's a growing thing and it seems to be a good thing. From The Big Interview, Feliz Navidad, Bon Nadal, Happy Christmas. Thanks for being there. I mean it.